the feisty news for women. Hello and welcome to the feisty news for women. I am T. Erica. I present important women's issues and fearless feminine voices disrupting our society. Today is February 13th, 2022. Here is the feisty news for women. Chile has a new government, and even before it takes office, it has broken a record with the highest number of women in key positions, a clear majority, 14 out of 24. On January 21st, the president-elect Gabriel Boric announced the names of those who will make up his cabinet, and for the first time, the majority of his members will be women. This is a first considering that the majority of political leaders worldwide are men. As noticed by the UN Women, the United Nations agency dedicated to gender equality and the empowerment of women, data shows that women are underrepresented at all levels of decision-making worldwide, and achieving a gender parity in political life is far off. According to UN Women, as of the September 1st, 2021, only 21% of government ministers were women. Only 14 countries have achieved 50% or more women in cabinets. Well, what does this mean for women? This is a monumental time in history because for the first time, we will witness the impact of what a majority female-led government will have on a community. UN Women predicts that gender parity in ministerial positions will not be achieved before 2077. How can we speed up the process of gender equality in politics? Well, today, Naila Amaru, Nayela Amaru is with us. Nayela is a nationally recognized advocacy and policy strategist with an established 20 plus year record of building grassroots governing power among underserved populations. Nayela, what kind of difference will a female majority governing board make in Chile? It can make a big one. You know, it's really important to understand that women who run for public office oftentimes bring a different set of priorities when it comes to legislative agenda setting. Um, and a lot of that is rooted in a very different lived experience than a lot of male politicians. And so when women are in positions of power, particularly such as a governing board, it can have a tremendous impact in terms of what type of issues are being discussed, what are the policy solutions that are being uh, considered, um, to help fix, you know, whatever issues that Chile or any country or, or city may be dealing with. Um, and that's really important to recognize, particularly in terms of, you know, issues that are oftentimes associated with um, as such a quote unquote women's issues. Um, every issue is a woman's issue because women are half of the population and are impacted by all the policies but are oftentimes impacted in very different ways. Um, and so I'm really excited, um, you know, for, for this development and excited to see, you know, the, the type of impact that they will continue to have when it comes to, again, legislative agenda setting and having uh, discussions in terms of what is the best way forward uh, to serve their respective cities and country. Nayela, can you tell us what needs to happen in order for us to achieve gender equality in politics? Absolutely. So I think the first thing uh, is to redefine political leadership, right? Oftentimes, women are already civically engaged in their communities and different roles. But because formal positions of leadership have historically always been held by men, society and women themselves too often don't associate themselves with leadership or recognize leadership traits within them. So I would say, I would say first and foremost is to redefine what people understand political leadership to be and what it looks like, um, and more institutional in terms of structural reforms, um, I think it's really important to change the electoral process that have very deep-rooted institu institutional barriers for women participating in politics. For example, one, financial constraints, right? When money dominates our political system, too often women end up losing out. And that's because, you know, for a variety of reasons. One, women oftentimes have lower incomes for many reasons. There's a gender gap in pay, there's occupational segregation, disproportionate um, unpaid family care. Um, you know, oftentimes um, there's an unwillingness to, to, to negotiate for, for higher salaries. There's a lot of reasons of why, you know, um, women have, you know, lower incomes and how that translates um, to different social and business networks and how that has an impact when it comes to raising uh, um, funding for your campaigns 
there's a difference that it's very distinct that is oftentimes very gendered, again, because women have different professional networks than men, which can be a disadvantage to them when money has such an outsized role in our politics. And the last two things I would say is just to change the social and cultural barriers. We have persisting gender roles, um, particularly within the American context, but I would also argue globally that there is still this association of masculinity with leadership, right? And there is still this association um, with femininity as a weakness. Um, and so there is this dichotomous relationship of women who are perceived to be feminine or, or, or expected to be feminine running for what is traditionally considered a masculine role, such as elected office. Um, and also just to acknowledge the reality of family and work and time constraints. Again, just the reality um, under the social and cultural barriers of women participating in office, that there's still an uneven distribution of family care responsibilities. And that translates more women spending more time than men um, in home and child care. And so I would say most fundamentally to help, you know, um, uh, uh, neutralize those social and cultural and institutional barriers. It's really important that we create policies that promote gender equality and equity. You know, the laws and policies and procedures um, that promote gender equity um, and send essentially positive messages to women and to girls, right, about their roles and places in this country. When there is silence from the government um, on those issues, um, to understand that there's a long-term consequence to that. And so understanding that policy is, quote unquote, like whatever government does or does not do, um, it helps us realize that, again, state silence on the importance of gender equality has a long-term generational impact. Um, and so I think that's really important that with more women in office, um, we can begin to, again, create policies that promote gender equality so that we will not have to wait um, another 40, 50, 60 years in order for representation to be fair. Thank you, Nyella, for your insight about politics today. You can always follow Nyella on Twitter to keep up with her politics and other advocacy. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is referring to a new bill as the biggest workplace reform initiative of the Me Too era. The bill passed the Senate and the House of Representatives easily. If it becomes law, the new bill will end the use of a secretive legal process known as forced arbitration, which prevents many people from bringing sexual misconduct claims to court. A common requirement of many employment contracts is that the employee agrees to arbitration for employment issues instead of lit litigation, which means you cannot take the company to court when you have a complaint. Arbitration is the out-of-court resolution of a dispute between parties of a contract decided by an impartial third party. No judge, no jury, no mandatory law officials involved. Historically, forced arbitration has protected abuse and harassment perpetrators as the process keeps claims out of the public and offers no structure for appeals, often silencing people who are harmed. The legislation marks a significant change to employment law by giving people the option of suing in state, tribal, or federal courts and retroactively invalidating contracts that eliminated the possibility of doing so. Ha ha! Well, celebrity singer Adele attended the Brit Awards this week to collect the prize for Artist of the Year. The award show recently eliminated the gender-based categories Best Male and Best Female Artist to create a singular award. But the cheers for her win soon turned to outrage when she said, I understand why the name of this award has changed, but I really love being a woman and being a female artist. I do. That's what she said. Well, trolls took to Twitter to do what they normally do, focus on tearing a successful woman down. They called her a transphobe and accused her of using her platform to call for the destruction of the trans community. Damn, a can't say she loved being a woman? That's up. I love being a woman too. Yes, I said it. I do understand that there are people who feel that the body they were born into does not match the gender experience they are having inside. I believe in it. But still, due to biological differences, our society has created a way for us to communicate those differences with labels like male and female. That was the baseline that was created millions of years ago, just so that we could communicate and understand each other. We are no longer basic. The evolved stance is we get to express the gender that we feel so that we can love ourselves more. So if I feel like a woman and I love it, I should be able to say that. 
I don't want to be a man. First of all, they feet stink. When they come in the house and take off those dirty work boots, boots, it smells like a dead cat. And I'm like, ugh. And secondly, who wants to wake up every day and put on a mask of patriarchy to impress society? Not me. It's the freedom of being a feisty woman that makes me love being a woman. I get to be myself. I get to be pretty and witty and annoying and crazy, just like they love to say. Just like Adele, I love being a woman and I'm never going to not shout that out because someone hide behind a keyboard wants attention, knowing the only way they can get close to me is a type of angry message. Trolling, they mad at themselves eager to tear a successful woman down. Look, Adele, don't apologize. You're a feisty woman, and it is amazing to watch you enjoy being a woman. We're all here with you. Keep singing, keep shining. Wait, why is everyone saying Kanye is off his mask? Confused about COVID? Me too. Let's explore these topics right after the break. Come back. Hi, I'm Duffy, the founder of Disguise and Surprise. As a mom of two teenage boys, I got really frustrated when I was starting to wrap their presents because as they got older, the gifts they wanted started coming in very recognizable shaped boxes. Think cell phones, wireless earbuds, video games. If you hand it to them wrapped in that shaped box, they know what it is immediately before they open it. Boring, not okay. So I worked with some local labs and designed a set of dividers that are reusable and made in the USA. You take your dividers and you arrange them inside of a shirt box, either around your one special item to disguise or you make sections and you create your own multi-item gift boxes for any occasion throughout the year. Um, the beauty of it is, is the, what I call the universal shirt box mentality. Doesn't matter how old you are, if you get handed a shirt box, you think you're getting close. So when they lift that lid and see something that they really wanted or something way cooler, that's where the excitement comes in. So my mission is to get people to rethink how they give a gift. <laughs> shared a screenshot of a comment on Instagram where the commenter declared that he was no longer taking psychiatric, psych, psychiatric medication. Man's off the meds, the person wrote, to which Kanye replied, the world is racist, sexist, homophobic, and crazy phobic at our core. It's cheap and dismissive to say I'm off my meds anytime I speak up. Phobia in this sense doesn't mean being afraid of it. It means not giving power to it. Let's be more conscious and not write each other off so easily. Kanye's behavior is often described as erratic and mentally ill. Every time he makes emotional statements or expresses anger, jealousy, or frustration over his life openly and passionately. Men are not allowed to exhibit this behavior under patriarchal pressure. I'll admit, I am a Kanye West stan. Kanye has inspired me more than any other living human being, yet, Sometimes his behavior is a bit much for me, but why is that? Am I judging him based on patriarchal standards that I publicly renounce all the time? Am I being a hypocrite? Today we have Marie on the show to offer her comments about Kanye's latest headlines. Marie is a disability and anti-ableism activist. Born disabled, this former award-winning broadcast director became a very privately disabled art activist after experiencing disability discrimination that made her lose her career. Although Kanye does not identify as disabled, Marie believed that he is a victim of discrimination and ableism. Marie, can you help us to understand why Kanye is being described as off his meds? And is this an indication that ableism, an example of ableism that you advocate against? Oh, yes. Um, thank you so much to Erica for having me and just starting this conversation because it is so important because the ableist society, um, well, well, let's define ableism first. Ableism, as defined by Talia Lewis, is a system that places value on people's bodies and minds 
based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, intelligence, excellence, and productivity. And it goes on to say how it's deeply rooted in anti-Blackness, eugenics, colonialism. It's a longer definition, but that's the point we really want to make is that society has an idea of what is normal. And so if something goes against what that is, whether it's physical, whether it's appearance, whether it's thoughts, whether it's mental, then it's not normal. And it's crazy. It goes against everything we are. You're crazy for thinking that way. And that is weaponized. The word crazy is weaponized by the ableist society. And really, who are we to say if someone is off their meds? Who are we to say if someone is crazy when society is based off of opinions? It's based off of that. We don't have to agree with someone. We don't have to agree with what they're saying, but we sure as heck can't invalidate them by questioning their mental illness, questioning their physical illness, questioning anything about their body. Um, it, it's a very, uh, it, it's a very normalized concept. Questioning someone's body and mental status, the ableist society allows us to do that. But we, that's, it's not okay. We can't be okay with that. People shouldn't hop on this bandwagon right now to say, yeah, he's being crazy. Yeah, he's not fit for society. Look what crazy Kanye is doing. But that's not our place. It's not our place. That's the last place it's our place actually and uh, I really hope that conversations like this say Erica that people are starting to realize and understand that well yes something is widely accepted in society that doesn't make it okay and to start to realize that talking about someone's whatever whether it's their body whether it's their mind because the mind is part of the body talking about someone's person um we can't place that we can't place value on that depending on what we think it should be. Everyone is valuable. Everyone's thoughts matter. And that's the point of anti-ableist advocacy is to understand that there is not one body, mind, or soul that is more important. There are many different facets. And to be an inclusive society, we have to be an inclusive and accepting and supporting. And so calling someone crazy when we don't agree with what they're saying, that is not supporting. That will prevent someone to get the actual treatment that they need, the actual medical care, the actual support. That will prevent someone from receiving the acceptance they deserve. And that's not fair. Thank you for teaching us about ableism, Marie. Ableism is really a concept that we don't think much about because we're so busy judging ourselves and others against this standard of normalcy that everyone is merely pretending to attain. Most of us are faking normal, but if you don't, then you're crazy. That's ableism. If you wanna learn more about her work as an anti-ableism advocate, follow Marie on Instagram at rareadvocate. Nearly two years after the coronavirus outbreak took hold in the U.S., most adults say they felt confused as a result of the changes to public health officials' recommendations on how to slow the spread of the coronavirus. Do we need the vaccine? Is it mandatory? Do we need it to work? Should we get a booster? How many boosters? Does it really protect us? Am I going to die? We don't know the answers. We are living through a modern day plague and most of us do not know which information to trust. According to Pew Research, 60% of U.S. adults feel just as confused as you and I do. When it comes down to it, trust yourself. Make the decision that you can live with. We're all in the midst of this traumatic experience that has changed society as we know it. We are all adjusting together, mentally, financially, and spiritually. We will make it through, yet the trauma will have lasting effects. I just want things to go back to normal, but it'll never be the same. A new normal is emerging and we have to go with it, even if it hurts to follow the shift. When I feel overwhelmed, I remember that my mama always says, Tierra, just keep going. Instead of being angry, do your best and just keep going. A 61-year-old grandmother of 17 children is engaged to a man who is younger than she is, 37 years younger than she is. Cheryl McGregor met 24-year-old Sharon McCain when he was the co-worker of her son nearly 10 years ago. 
As adults, they began to date only a year ago and are now engaged and looking into having a child together by surrogate. The couple has an OnlyFans page and she is super proud of her man saying he's the most compassionate and emotional man she's ever been with. Well, all right, Granny. I guess it's really never too late to find the love you've been missing. I'm here for this love story, but I don't know about watching them on OnlyFans because that's not my favorite porn, porn search term. Well, thank you for watching the feisty news for women. And remember, be feisty. Women must be seen and heard.